contents of the book, and to now sort of drill down into, as you say, the sort of local, national context. I'm going to pass over to, to Elizabeth to, to speak about her research looking at Yemen in particular. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> as Simon has said, I've been focusing specifically on Yemen, uh, and I think this is a terribly important country, not only because of its geopolitical strategic location um, right on the border of uh, Saudi Arabia and Oman, but also with a maritime border to Somalia. You know, with a war raging in the west of the country, with the Saudi economy uh, spiralling downwards, and with an unclear succession in Oman, um, as well as a, a, a very large deficit in its finances, um, what the last thing we want is for jihadist groups, militant jihadist groups, to take root in Yemen. And yet that is exactly what happened in 2015. Um, you know, while the war that's currently raging in Yemen started to spiral out of control from uh, about March last year, March 2015, we saw a massive uh, ascendancy of al-Qaeda in Yemen. So while most global attention has been on Islamic State globally, you know, in the media, it's spectacular attacks. Of course, it produces a lot of material in English language, which is easily accessible. In Yemen, al-Qaeda has been playing a much longer game um, and with great effect. Uh, that's what my chapter looks at. Um, probably the numbers of al-Qaeda in Yemen, of actual fighters, were around about 4,000 um, during 2015, up until about April this year, uh, when special forces from UAE, with a bit of help from their friends, moved in on the al-Qaeda stronghold there. By contrast, Islamic State... It's difficult to put numbers on, on, on this, of course, because also what is al-Qaeda? You know, it, so, there's a, quite a lot of uniform swapping going on and uh, are alignments with tribal militias, with smuggling groups. So, you know, it's actually quite difficult to put a number on core fighters. But Islamic State, let's say, probably has no more than a couple of hundred, at a rough guess. Um, of course, you don't need numbers to make a big a splash in the media. You need spectacular attacks. And, and actually, Islamic State has been far better at that than has al-Qaeda. But that has also meant that it has resonated, Islamic State has resonated less well with local audiences inside Yemen. Um, Islamic State does tend to uh, seduce, let's say, a, a, a very angry young sector of the population uh, perhaps slightly more thuggish, looking for quick wins and liking the al-Qaeda branding, the very spectacular attacks. Uh, and we've seen lots of small groups pop up in Yemen. And these are latched onto by not just the media, but by intel organisations, um, think tanks, because it makes a good story. At one point last year, I, I, I kept reading that there were 10 provinces of the Islamic State in Yemen. And yet when I sent some of the tribesmen whom I work with um, to drive round to try to find some of them. They, they couldn't really find them. And they tend to be, often just be pockets of disgruntled youth, you know, waving a black flag in front of an iPhone. Um, and, and, you know, one has to be wary of seeing that as Islamic State expansion. Mm. Um, fundamentally, Islamic State hasn't got under the skin of populations in Yemen. And my chapter in this book really explains why. Um, what al-Qaeda does, by contrast, is it tries to plug into the local level first, and it does this really well. And then it grafts its global jihadist agenda, and I, by jihadist I, I'm always, in this context today, speaking about militant jihad, of course jihad means lots of things. It grafts its global agenda onto this local agenda, but it wins the local battles first. Um, I did some survey work in eastern Yemen in 2012 and 2013, just in the types of communities that in 2015 succumbed to uh, al-Qaeda expansion. And this, I asked over 2,000 tribesmen and tribeswomen uh, a bunch of questions about their aspirations and, and thoughts. Um, only 21% 
said that they wanted their religious leaders to intervene in all areas of life. And only 10% said they wanted a single strong leader. And so, you know, there's really very little natural appetite for a caliphate, but particularly not one that was, that's remote in Syria or Iraq. They have enough trouble answering to Yemen's own uh, capital and Sana'a. Um, and yet it was precisely in these kinds of populations that al-Qaeda managed to take root. And I think it's important to note that it didn't do this by terrorising the population. My survey also showed that uh, households in this eastern region of Yemen have more, more guns per household than they do books. So, you know, you're not going to terrorise them easily. And so here I think one has to raise a very important point. Al-Qaeda's success was not so much about recruiting into the Mujahideen, into the ranks of fighters. It's much more about winning passive toleration. It's about winning support to the extent that, well, we weren't served very well by the state previously, and we might as well just go along with this for the time being. This was particularly the case because Al-Qaeda was very clever at plugging into local grievances. Um, in 2016, January this year, it, I think quite a significant event happened. It split off its governance arm from its military operations. This is a new development, and it showed how it had learned from its previous experiences in Yemen, um, how it reacted to populations. Um, when I analysed the Twitter feed of its governance arm, I noticed that 57% of all tweets were actually about community development projects. Only 3% were about the Hadood punishments of Islamic law. Only 3% were about uh, chopping off someone's hand or uh, stoning someone for adultery. And yet this is the 3% that got picked up by the media and by uh, think tanks and by intelligence agencies and talked about. And so we end up with a slightly skewed perspective on what's really going on. And by the way, when those kinds of operations were happening, when those hand choppings and um, stonings were happening from al-Qaeda, they were institutionalised in the sense that, unlike Islamic State, they would take place in a public arena, but cordoned off. Crowds would be kept at a distance. They couldn't really see what was happening. And there would always be a police car or an ambulance on side. Um, and they were not live filmed. And there were no graphic photographs. So, you know, this made it seem like a state that was governing. Uh, this is quite different from Al-Qaeda. Um, Al-Qaeda also... Sorry, this, that was quite different from Islamic State. Mm. Um, Al-Qaeda also got its local branding right. It called itself by local names, like Sons of Hadramaut. It branded everything from buses to first aid kits with uh, gifts from your brothers, the Sons of Hadramaut. Uh, it was also able to position itself as the good guy, in contrast to Islamic State, and apologised for some what it called wild card attacks, uh, like there was a beheading of about 14 soldiers by al-Qaeda, but it apologised for that and said these, this was not under our auspices. It apologised for an attack on a hospital. It outlawed bombings of mosques that Islamic State was doing. So Islamic State gave it an opportunity to position itself um, as almost as the moderate jihad. Mm. I'm conscious I've only got a minute, I think, left. <laughs> um, so just a couple of words now about communication. Al-Qaeda was also very good in Yemen at plugging into local, uh, local ways of communication, traditional norms. Um, it made extensive use of poetry, and that's my speciality. Um, in fact, in its magazine, which uh, it had a, uh, an all-round magazine which came out between... 2008 and 2011, 20% of the pages contained poetry, and yet it was always overlooked by analysts. Mm. Um, and the poetry really played an important role in its two main narratives, which I discuss in my chapter, which were the celebration and are the celebration of death. Of course, this is incredibly important. You have to position even the death of uh, one of your mujahideen in a drone strike or a shootout as a glorious death in an epic battle. And the poetry really helps to do that. And then secondly, constructing the enemy. You know, for local populations, you have to boil down a 
complex political landscape into something that's very simple, easy to understand, black and white, good versus evil, an apocalyptic battle. Um, Al-Qaeda's narratives did that very well. And unlike Islamic State, they felt local. They plugged into tribal history. They positioned today's jihad as something that was just a continuation of the independence fight of their forefathers, your tribal forefathers in the 1960s. And so finally, let me just end by saying it might look like we're winning the battle against al-Qaeda now. When special forces went into Mukalla in April, at the end of April this year, however, you know, al-Qaeda was not defeated in a big, uh, a big shootout or a big battle. It withdrew. It was tactical. It was even able to position this as a mercy act on its part to save the population. It's still there. And although it's being droned in dribs and drabs, um, and many of its fighters have melted away. We've seen this before. This happened in 2012. And yet, three years later, it came back stronger. So I think we have to be very careful about imagining that it's now on the back foot and being defeated. I think we will only defeat it if we take a leaf out of its own playbook. We get into communities and engage locally, using narratives that resonate locally, to take away the reasons for populations tolerating al-Qaeda in the first place, then we stand a chance. Mm. Thank Elizabeth, thank you very much.